Good afternoon or evening. We are so excited you're able to join us today. My name is Susan Evans and I'm a caregiver. My father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease 12 years ago and it felt like overnight and went from being a daughter to a caregiver. For both my father concerned with the progression of his disease and my mother who became literally half widowed. We kept my father at home as long as we could with caregivers and trips to adult daycare, but my father's behavior became too much for my mother and I did not want to lose both my parents to this dreadful disease. We chose Kensington Senior Living for my father because of their expertise in memory care. He lived there six years and the team took care of my father as part of their family and my mother who visited and had lunch with him daily. Thank you, Kensington, for the care of my family, and thank you for producing these educational webinars for the community. You are all in for a special treat today as authors Lauren Dykovich, William Peters, Christy Burns Yates, and Tammy Anastasia share with you their books and their personal experiences and journeys with dementia. Kensington has a very special guest moderating today's event, Marianne Shuko, founder of All's Authors. I met Marianne a few months ago after being introduced by Christy. Thank you, Christy, as it has been a pleasure to get to know Marianne. We all share a similar past with dementia, but our journeys have been so different. The audience is in for a treat today. I feel honored to be part of this discussion. You will all receive copies of today's webinar to share with friends and family, and please respond to the email with any questions you have. There will also be links to purchase the books from our amazing authors and link to All's Authors website. Please get your questions ready and we will have a live Q&A at the end of the program. Please join me in welcoming Marianne. Marianne, please share a few words about yourself and All's Authors for the audience. And please everyone know that Marianne is also an author. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Marianne. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for inviting me to moderate this event. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Hi, everyone. I am also a caregiver. I was responsible for the care of both my mom and my stepfather who had dementia. My mother did not have dementia, and I'm always very careful to point that out because it was something that she was dreadfully afraid of. She would pray, please, God, don't let me get dementia. So when my stepfather was diagnosed, it was just um, rocked her world. And I was the long distance caregiver as the only daughter. And uh, since then, my journey has come to its natural ending. But um, it has been a privilege for me to care for both of them and, and to be on the journey with them. Now, I founded All's Authors, the global organization of authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience after I had written my own book, a novel called Blue Hydrangeas, an Alzheimer's Love Story. This was based upon people I met in my work as a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I worked in both long-term care and in the hospital setting. And over many years, I had come to know so many people living with dementia and their families. And they really meant a lot to me. They were my favorite people, to be honest. And when I finally decided to sit down and write a book, which was my lifetime dream, I chose to write it based on people I'd met in dementia care. And that later brought me to um, connect with two other wonderful authors to build All's Authors, which is now 300 authors strong. And we are promoting Alzheimer's and dementia awareness and provide support for caregivers through the written word and storytelling. And we also provide resources through blogging, 
podcasting and film as well. So we're pretty expansive and you will find many resources to help guide you on your journey using other people's stories, learning what they've learned along the way. All of this is very hard earned knowledge. Our authors are full of insight and we have stories and books available on all dementia diagnoses and all situations of care, whether you're caring for a parent, a spouse, a grandparent, or even a child with dementia. We do have one of those stories. And we also have a beautiful selection of stories written by people who are living with the disease themselves. In my opinion, those are the most valuable because very rarely are we able to learn what's going on in their heads and how this illness affects them right from their own words. And we have lots of books on that. And on our YouTube channel, we have a video where you can watch five of them talk about their disease process. So that's a little bit about me. And this is not all about me tonight. I would love to interview, introduce you to our wonderful authors, almost all of whom are in All's Authors. And um, one of them may be if he takes my invitation on. So. Um, Please allow me to introduce you to Lauren Dykovitz. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Mary Hi there. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes. Now, Lauren and I go back quite a way. She has two books, and she's got a beautiful blog, and she's got a lot of stuff going on. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Lauren? Sure. My name is Lauren Dykovitz. I'm a writer and author and a mentor for Alzheimer's Daughters. I'm also the founder of the Alzheimer's Daughters Club, which is an online membership community that supports women who have a parent with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. My mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in July of 2010 when she was 62 years old, and I was only 25 years old at the time. Um, I quit my first full-time job a few, a few years into her diagnosis and became a part-time caregiver for her at the age of 28. And my dad and I, along with my sister and some other family members, took care of my mom at home um, the entire length of her illness. During the first few years after my mom's diagnosis, I really had a hard time finding a lot of information about early onset Alzheimer's. Again, this was back in 2010. Uh, so there wasn't as much widely available information as there is today. And I also could not find anyone else my age being 25 um, that was going through this with a parent. So that inspired me to start my blog, which is called Life, Love, and Alzheimer's. And writing my blog led to writing and publishing my two books, which are both memoirs. Um, the first was called Learning to Weather the Storm, a story of life, love, and Alzheimer's. And the second is When Only Love Remains, surviving my mom's battle with early onset Alzheimer's. My mom did sadly pass away in April of 2020, um, but although she is no longer physically here with us, I've made it my mission to help others who are going through this. And I really feel like I'm still just getting started. Thank you so much, Lauren. Your story is unique um, in that you were so young to have encountered this. And I really appreciate your courage in sharing your story. Of course, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce next Tammy Anastasia. Tammy is a professional in dementia in the dementia field and has a lot to share and a lot of expertise to help caregivers. Hi, Tammy. Hi, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. As Marianne mentioned, my name is Tammy Anastasia, and I am a dementia consultant educator, and the author of Essential Strategies for the Dementia Caregiver, Learning to Pace Yourself, P-A-C-E. I also have a private practice, which now I can do virtually, and I provide dementia guidance, emotional support, and care strategies to families and professional caregivers. And I also facilitate several caregiver support groups. And my Alzheimer's journey actually started about 40 years ago. My beloved Italian grandmother 
was labeled as being senile. And now you fast forward 40 years and my grandmother had the classic symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And I wish I knew how to support my dad because it just tore him up. And I didn't really understand what he was going through. So now as a dementia consultant and educator and a support group facilitator, I wanted to write a book that uh, educates the reader and walks by the caregiver's side all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end of this journey so that um, I can talk about how the changes, uh, dementia is gonna change your loved one, how those changes are going to affect the caregiver. And I also talk about the conflicting emotions that caregivers deal with as they go through this journey. And I also help the caregivers line up their ducks, what's coming down the pike. And then I address 11 of the most challenging uh, behaviors. So two of my main goals for writing my book were to help the caregiver survive this journey so it's not at the expense of your physical, mental, and emotional well-being, and also to make this journey as loving, compassionate, kind, and supportive as possible. That's terrific. Thank you so much. And next we have Christy Yates. Christy did what is called double dementia duty. Hey, Christy. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. And thanks, Susan, for pulling this all together. And I'm delighted to be here with Tammy and Lauren and William um, and Marianne. Really enjoying working with you. Um, so my parents both had um, dementia. My mom, my father had vascular dementia. And my, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And they both died seven weeks apart in 2015. And about the um, last six years of their life, uh, my husband and our two kids who were really um, late elementary, early middle school, and then into high school, those were the years when they were, um, when we were doing a lot of care. They didn't live with us, but we eventually had to um, move them into assisted living. That's what they had um, expressly desired. They bought a life a long-term healthcare policy that only uh, supported assisted living. Um, so all of those things kind of came together and, and we struggled through it, but I was looking for so much support. I was working full-time as a school psychologist, um, raising two kids, and then now managing the care of my parents, um, going to every different doctor appointment, all these things, and still trying to kind of keep it all together. And there were so many times when I had to choose between something that I needed to do with my kids and something that I needed to do for my, my parents. And there were j just those um, heart-wrenching moments at times. And so my book talks a little bit about that. Um, it also talks about um, what it meant for my husband and I, how we kind of came to the understanding of you know, we need to put some things in place. We're, we're taking care of my folks and they had done so many things to make it easy for me. Um, I have a brother and sister who I'm on really great terms with, but they didn't live anywhere near us. I was five minutes from my parents. So clearly I was going to be the one to take care of them. And that's fine. I, 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 I really cherish those moments with them. Um, but my parents had a trust and they had a will and they had a financial plan and they had purchased the long-term health care, and they had end-of-life wishes all spelled out. So it was very easy for me to do that, easy in terms of executing what they already had desired. Painful in that I, I had to do it all, but um, that's the legacy of love. So my book is called Building a Legacy of Love, Thriving in the Sandwich Generation, and I take the lessons I learned in going through this time period and apply them to, okay, how can I move forward and pass this on to my kids? How can I make sure they're prepared for when the normal natural progression of life is we all will pass away. And so how do we deal with that? The other piece that was really important to me is as a school psychologist, I know that kids are impacted by mm -hmm. their parents doing a lot of caregiving. Um, when a parent is stressed out and, and really 
in the throes of anticipatory grief, right? Really watching someone fade away. Um, this impacts our parenting in so many ways. And those moments came crystal clear to me at different times. It was painful, but it was very um, eye opening. And so I write a lot about that too. And that's sort of the work that I'm doing now. I retired last year from school psychology. I'm a licensed educational psychologist here in California, but I'm really trying to um, open up conversations about the sandwich generation and how we can have a holistic, whole family perspective. So there you go. All right. That's wonderful. I do want to point out um, Christy's dedication to talking about children during um, a family's dementia journey. And um, All's Authors has several books available for children from all reading levels, from very young early readers into middle grade and then young adult, a lot of young adult fiction. So if you have somebody in your life that could benefit, maybe by reading a book or a story to learn more about the you know grandparent or even a parent's dementia, that would be helpful. Lastly, I wanna introduce William Peters. Thank you. Thank you, Great, good to see you again. Thank you, uh, good to be here. Um, I have a real fondness for Kensington. Um, my father uh, was a resident of Kensington for about four years before he died in 2020, September. Um, and we were very blessed as a family that that happened in one of the initial and few breaks in which caregivers could come in and be at the bedside of their dying anywhere in any, you know, any of these facilities. So um, had a really great experience the last four days with my father. I'll share a little bit about that later. But me personally, I'm a psychotherapist, a licensed, and I specialize in end of life. Uh, and so this natural path that we'll all go on, uh, declining, aging, and eventually dying is something that I work with families and individuals. Um, that's, that's the core of my practice. The specialty I have within it is spiritual experiences at the end of life. And there are a great deal of them that are uh, sadly little known and recognized in our culture. And yet they provide such healing for uh, the surviving loved ones. Um, I'm the author of the book, At Heaven's Door, uh, which share journeys to the afterlife, teach about dying well and living better. And it is from uh, my research. I direct a research institute here in Santa Barbara and have other colleagues, uh, quite frankly, around the world, a number of other consultants who are basically collecting these beautiful spiritual experiences at the end of life. And I wrote them up in a book and uh, I'm glad to be sharing it with you all today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Your book is very insightful and I think people will get a lot from it. All of the books are insightful and cover a variety of different situations and needs, and maybe some things you hadn't even thought about yet. Certainly a lot of the things that you might be wondering about is, as you're going on your caregiving journey, that's one thing there's always too much of, and that's questions. And we know that caregivers are very busy and, and they're harried and juggling many different things, putting out little fires all the time. And books can provide you with guidance that you can you know, pick up, thumb through it. You don't have to be sit down and read the whole thing, but you can pick and choose which sections that you want to read. And it's a good idea to have a nice collection of books available at home so that you can get the support and guidance as you need it. So um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is of, of Tammy. We're gonna start with Tammy. And I wanted to talk about needs because there are so many needs associated um, with a, any caregiving, but especially with dementia. We have both the needs of the loved one, the person who is living with the um, disease, but we also have the needs of the caregiver and the family. So um, can you help to define that? What are the needs of a person with dementia and what are the needs of the caregiver and how do we meet them? Yeah, that's a great question. So mm -hmm. let me start with the needs of the person with dementia. You know, as dementia progresses, um, their world is not the world they once knew it to be. So as the person with dementia starts to progress, their needs increase and they become more and more dependent on the caregiver for the following things. They need reassurance. They need the reassurance and support. They need to feel safe and secure. They need physical comfort and care. 
and they need to be validated. You know, they may not make sense a lot of times, but we need to hear what they're saying and we need to communicate back to the person with dementia. We hear you and we understand. They also need stimulation. They need cognitive stimulation, physical stimulation and social engagement. And what happens as this disease progresses is that they lose this ability to be self-starters. They lose the ability to initiate. And what often happens is they retrieve and they go inward. So now we have to provide for them the things that we know that would be really good for them. And then also one thing that we also really need to provide for them all the way through this journey is a sense of purpose, a sense of value, and a sense of importance. That doesn't go away. And how we can make them feel important can be modified. We get caught up in the things they can't do and we gotta focus on the things they still can do and give them a sense of purpose. Make them feel they, they're important, that they, you know, honey, it would be so great if you could help me with this or I just love when we spend time together doing this. So that sense of importance and value is a need that we all think, dementia or not, all need till end of life, till our end of life. Now, the care, the needs for the caregiver are huge. There's a ton of needs. So I thought, okay, how am I gonna narrow this down? So I came up with different um, categories. Number one, taking care of yourself. That is really, really, really hard to do with this disease because it's so demanding and challenging. So one of the things I advise uh, is that caregivers take at least a 10 minute daily time out and do something nurturing or comforting. But you have to make a conscious effort to do this because it's a fine line between taking care of your loved one and taking care of yourself. But you're both equally as important. So we have to make sure you take care of yourself. The other category I came up with is stay connected. It is so hard to stay connected with this disease, but I don't care how you do it. Maybe once a week, uh, Sally texts you, checking in just to say hello, or once a week, it's um, having you know tea and coffee um, over the phone, but somehow build in a way to stay connected with friends and family because it is a isolating very isolating and can be a very lonely disease. The third thing that I came up with is get all the emotional support you can get. I can't stress enough the importance of emotional support, whether it's joining a, a support group, reaching out to a consultant like myself or a therapist, but that emotional support, you have to have a place to talk about what this is like for you. And then ask for help. Uh, your intentions are good, you're well-meaning, you want to do this journey on your own, and I'm going to tell you, de dementia is going to demand more than what one person can do on their own. De mm -hmm. Dementia demands it. You're not failing, it's that dementia demands more care than what one person can provide. And then educate yourself about the disease, educate yourself about yourself. What pushes your buttons so we can be prepared and we can give you responses. So when your buttons get pushed, we know how to respond versus react. And then of course, get to know your loved one even better and look at their body language, cue into them and know what their triggers are. And then the last category I came up with is believe in yourself. You need to know you are a wonderful, wonderful caregiver. You need to know you're providing such wonderful care for your loved one. What does that mean? We're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. A bad day doesn't make you a bad caregiver. A bad day means it was a tough day today. It was a challenging, challenging. But all the way through this journey, you need to know you are a wonderful caregiver and you're providing wonderful, wonderful care for your loved one. And there's no perfect roadmap. You learn by doing, mistakes are opportunities to learn from. So instead of judging yourself and beating yourself up, I want you to give back to yourself and know that you are a wonderful and amazing caregiver and person. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You just gave us like so much information that listeners can take home and, and use. I love that. Lauren, I, I wanted to speak with you about your mom's uh, early onset Alzheimer's. That's something that a lot of people may not even be aware of, but people as young as in their 40s 
are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. How did you come to accept your mom's diagnosis? It was really difficult. Uh, as I said earlier, she was diagnosed when she was 62. And of course, when you look back, you can see the signs starting even earlier than that. So I'm sure it was starting in her mid to late uh, 50s while I was still in college. And it was really difficult when she first got the diagnosis. You know, I wasn't denying the fact that my mom had Alzheimer's. I wasn't denying that she was having trouble remembering or knowing how to do things, but I was denying that Alzheimer's was the cause of, of that forgetfulness or that behavior. I just thought that my mom should just know how to do certain things. She should just be able to do this. She's still young. She's in her early 60s. This is something that you know, comes for someone who's much older than her. And I just sort of felt like she just wasn't trying and she had just given up. Um, and I really just would look at how much of her I had lost and how much I would continue to lose. And at the time of her diagnosis, I had just graduated college a couple of years before that. I was just working my first adult, like real full-time job ever. And I was just starting to have that adult friendship relationship with my mom. So all I could focus mm -hmm. on was the fact that I lost that before I ever even had it. And I would look at other women my age, my friends, my other peers, and I would just be so jealous of the relationships that they had with their moms, that the things they were still able to do with their moms and the friendships they were creating with their moms. And I just... I felt really sorry for myself. And I cried all the time in just feeling like I had lost everything and I would just continue to lose more and more of her and our relationship over the years. And I don't really know how or when it happened, but it was like, at some point I just realized, oh wow, she's actually gonna die from this someday. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get any better. It's only going, going to continue to get worse from here. And I realized that having a different mom, having a different relationship with her, maybe it wouldn't be the relationship I had always pictured and the future that I had always pictured with my mom being a part of it, but it would be better than nothing at all. And I really wanted to try to make the most of that and cherish what time we did still have left together instead of just focusing on everything that I had lost and feeling really sorry for myself all the time. I realized that it was not really about me. It was about her. It was about my mom and what she was going through. And so I was able to take the focus off of myself and put the focus more on my mom and what she needed. And what could I do to bring her joy? As Tammy was talking about the purpose, how can I give my mom a purpose? How can I make her feel like she still matters, she still counts and give her as much of a quality of life as I can given the circumstances? And I came to realize that although I could never change the outcome of this disease, I could definitely change the journey and not just for her or for myself, but for both of us and for, for our family as a whole. And it came with that acceptance that I was able to really change my perspective on things. And it really made for a much more as positive as it could be journey with my mom. And I'm forever grateful that I was able to have that change of perspective. That's so insightful. I mean, I'm sure the audience can take a lot from that. And I know that many people have a hard time accepting the diagnosis as a terminal illness. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And that really is, is a, a gut punch when you realize that and when you realize there's nothing you can do to stop it. That's hard. And then also you talked about how you felt isolated because many of your peers, your friends, coworkers, people your own age, they weren't experiencing this because they were in a different part of life. So Christy, right. you talk about the sandwich generation. Right. And, and can I... you... Go ahead. 
but yeah, <laughs> like, let's hear a little bit more about what that's like. Cause you were, you know, your journey was a little different cause you were a mom and you had children and you were caring for your parents. So now, well, now we're moving on here. And I could really resonate with you, Lauren, because I felt um, a lot of guilt mm -hmm. about how much deny, how many months or even year I was in denial about my mom's memory. You know, people were saying something's, something's up with your mom. And I would say, mm -hmm. no, she's just worried about my dad and that's anxiety. I had all these excuses and I would beat myself up later, like, what kind of a psychologist are you, Christy? Look at you, you you're totally in denial, but you know what? we that's one of the things we do as human beings is we don't want to face it and that's why you know i highly recommend working with um neutral parties to help you understand this working with doctors working with case managers and so on the sandwich generation is um in 2014 uh which is like <laughs> so many years ago the pew that's the one of the later studies um pew research center um estimated about 47% of Americans are in this situation where it's uh, people living with kids under the age of 18 in their home. It could even be adult children living in your home, but you're providing some parenting and then you're caring for an aging parent. Um, COVID really shifted everything. A lot of people um, had to bring um, elders home. They couldn't manage on their own. There were a number of people who even brought their family members out of assisted living to be in their home with them because they didn't want to not be able to see them. So there's a lot, we're seeing lots more multi-generational families. And truthfully, in some cultures, we wouldn't call it a sandwich generation. It's just normal and natural that grandma and grandpa live with us until the end of their life, right? But mm -hmm. but for many sections of America, that's not true. It's, it's we move around um, by all estimates, the average American probably moves 11 times from the place that they were born. And uh, we move, we're, we're just, we're, we're all over the place, right? Um, and we get busy and then women are having, many women, not all women, but some women are having children later in life. And so you got all these different demographics and the baby boomers are all um, <laughs> retiring and aging, just all kinds of different things that are impacting this, where you just have a, a huge, it, I would estimate at least 50% of Americans are in this spot where they're providing some sort of care. And it, if it's not physical one-on-one -on -one care, it might be financial support. It might be helping your parent to get the care they need. Um, and so there's a whole lot of things that go into that. And then in the meantime, you've got your kids who are growing up. And I think that's what I missed. And when I looked out for, for information, I was Googling things all the time. And I found lots of support for what to do for my parents, which I needed to be sure. But I didn't find anything that spoke to, okay, and don't forget to look at your kids and think about what's going on for them. Um, they're watching you. And so Tammy, you talked about self-care being so important. And I really feel like absolutely 100%, and it's a great opportunity for your kids to see you put yourself first. We think of it as being really selfish, like, oh, I've just got to burn the candle at, you know, deeper on both ends. Mm -hmm. And no, really, our children are learning from us about how we're raising adults. We're not raising children to continue to be children, right? So this is a great example for them. And when I could shift my mindset to that, trust me, it didn't happen that seamlessly okay yeah. <laughs> it was painful and rocky but yeah we all have to kind of look at how do we make the most of that and i and i do feel like it had a huge impact on my kids but you know what i really see um compassion is empathy and action and my kids had an opportunity to take their natural empathy and put it into action with my parents they were so beautiful with them they answered the same question five times in a five minute period. It was okay. It was as if it was asked the first time. They learned that. And they taught me at times, you know, when they'd say, mom, you need to be nicer to grandma. I mean, really, that was wonderful. And how great that they could tell me that. And um, with love, really, truly. So that's that's the sandwich generation. And they're all different kinds of layers to that. I mean, you could be raising grandchildren, multifamily family generations in one household. Yeah. So that's what we have. Can I, 
can I ask yes. both both of uh, you, Lauren and Christy, because you both took care of a parent. Um, also, um, and, and William, I'll have a different question for you, um, or, or both, actually all three of you, because you're taking care of a parent, role reversal is part of this journey, right? You become sort of the parent to parenting your parent. Exactly. What was what was that transition like? What or, or was it easy to make that transition? Were you aware that that transition was happening? I know it's a natural progression that just kind of happens. So as, as now the daughters and a son, and now you're now sort of parenting a parent, what was that like for, for you guys? So I, I actually do talk about this in my book, Tammy. I'm so glad you brought that up because I really feel like it wasn't, I sort of reject the notion of I'm parenting my parent. I have a new relationship mm -hmm. with them and it did evolve and it did mm -hmm. change it. But you know what? I, I did come across those times where I'm like, you know, I'm taking the key car keys away from my dad while I'm handing them off to my son. You know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. this is like twilight yeah. zone yeah. stuff. Right. And so you have to mm -hmm. kind of think through that. But for me, it was, how can I be as respectful with them? but also be clear about what needs to happen um, when, when I needed to take a more directive action with them because they, they couldn't do it themselves. And um, that was hard. I did have to bring in help um, because they couldn't hear it from me that it wasn't okay. My mom was mixing up all my dad's pills and I mean, just they were not safe in their own home anymore. And, um, that was hard for them to see. So I brought in professionals to do an evaluation. And so that was my experience, Lauren. I'm and, and William, I'm not sure what you experienced. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with what you said about um, rejecting the idea of parenting your parent. Uh, I still cringe when people say it's just like raising kids or no, it's it's not. I'm not a parent, I don't have children, but I know it's different. I know when you're raising a child, it's hard, but there are positive milestones. There's happy things happening. And when you are taking care of your parent, it's not that way. They're going the opposite direction and they're declining and it's not the same. Um, and I, so I do really sort of cringe when I hear people um, make that comparison because I do think it's very different. Um, and also, as you had said, what was that like? Did it come naturally? For me, no. I was 25 years old. I did. My mom was not old to me. I thought she should be able to take care of herself. And I didn't like the um, idea of doing certain things for her and, and the sort of I, I never really even thought about it until recently when one of the uh, members of my uh, membership community had mentioned how it's awkward for her to hold her mom's hand or to hug her mom or to do certain affectionate things like that. And it was for me too. I was in my twenties. That wasn't cool. I was, you know, it was awkward and it didn't come naturally to me at all until really I started to see how much she was declining. And then it was it was just totally different. It was a game changer because then I, I could see how much difficulty she was having. And that in a weird way, like it, that made me, uh, it made it easier for me to take care of her because I felt like she really needs my help. Um, but it, it never came naturally to me at first until it was sort of like such a drastic change um, that, that she clearly needed my help. But I, I also felt that I was parenting, if you know, the role reversal with my dad too, because as her caregiver, I felt like in my 20s, I was now taking care of both of my parents. And my dad didn't have dementia. He never had any cognitive issues, but the emotional stress and just being um, difficulty making decisions for her care and things that my sister and I really had to sort of like take over those things. And, you know, it was, uh, it, there was just a lot going on there with um, trying to take care of both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. William, how about for you? 
You know, I, I saw my my role in the family system because I live in Santa Barbara. My father was up in Redwood City, Kensington. My mother uh, was really the primary caregiver. I mean, we'd come up and visit. But like I said, during COVID, where, where the needs were high, we were not allowed to visit. So um, what I really find, I think this is really important, I think all of us can relate to this, is how do you deal with the different family dynamics? Like, mm-hmm. you know, even 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 the first steps of encouraging my mom that it's okay for you who are exhausted and, you know, and depressed because it makes sense. You're losing your life partner of 60 years in a way that, you know, used to be so active and together. And now you have to get calls from the local police department because he's got sundowners and he's four blocks away and you don't even know it. Yeah. So this became, these are all difficult conversations to say, mom, it's okay. Um, and so I think my family was really good about, um, you know, talking to one another, supporting each other, all feeling the loss of my father's decline. He was a very active, you know, man and a go-getter. And the last thing he ever wanted to be was to be a burden to anybody. And here he was, a real burden to my mom. And so um, that's kind of how I see this. It's like I, my role and what I learned was how, it, how many different perspectives there can be mm-hmm. about this situation, mm-hmm. which I know you guys are all experts mm-hmm. in this particular dealing with dementia, but also how we have to really be kind and loving and let all of the players in the family system have their process about you know, my mom was the last one to let go of my wow. father and allow him to be put in a in this loving Kensington community for which at the end she was like, I should have done this a lot, long time ago. Yeah. But mm-hmm. but it was hard for her. And all the rest of us are like, we're giving mom her time until she can't do it anymore. So. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to touch on um, <clears throat> a topic that we've all mentioned, and that is the end of life. Um. Alzheimer's dementia is a, is a terminal illness and it does come to a natural conclusion. And I wanted to ask William about his experience with what is called the shared death experience. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Marianne. Yeah, mm-hmm. I appreciate the way you frame that and um, is that, hey, we all know uh, we're all gonna die and mm-hmm. our culture is very resistant to that reality. And so we seem to be surprised by it when it comes, when in fact, it's the only thing we know that's going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I'd say that just, you know, matter of factly, because that's what's true. And once you go through that door and realize, wow, every I'm going to die and everyone I know is going to die. It leads to a natural sense of curiosity. And that's what happened to me in my practice, because so much of what I deal with as a psychotherapist is people's fear of death. When they get a terminal diagnosis, they're completely paralyzed. And so as I worked with people through the different stages, I started hearing about these different spiritual experiences that my clients in grief and bereavement were quite frankly uh, cautious, to use a kind word, to share it because they thought that me as a mental health practitioner would diagnose them with some sort of delusional situation or worse yet, a psychotic break. And um, what I found was that these experiences are not only common throughout our, our culture nowadays, they are recognized and in the research literature since, for, since the late 1800s um, in the London so- Society for Psychical Research. So basically, I got, I want to say this now, I think it's, not, it's fair to say, I got bold and took on my practitioners and said, I know these experiences happen. I started doing groups in, in Southern, in, uh, well, Santa Barbara, and, and people rolled in in droves. I mean, I was doing groups for 20, 25 people, you know, four or five groups a year. So I uh, learned about this experience that was identified by Dr. Raymond Moody called the shared death experience. And this is, this is amongst the many end of life experiences. This is the most um, sublime, the most divine, the most sacred, because it happens like this. A loved one dies and the caregiver loved ones who are the surviving loved ones report that they feel like they shared in some part of this transition into a benevolent afterlife. And it looks a lot like, for those of you who are familiar with the near-death experience, it has a lot of those phenomena. You actually see your departing loved one in their transition. You observe them, you sense them, you feel them. 
and you feel that they're in a good place, that it's, that's okay. So you have these feelings of love pouring down into you that's totally transforming your fear of death and what you think or, or removing any fear about what might be happening to your transitioning loved one. Uh, and so that's been the, the, the uh, focus of my research. And it was what I published uh, my book recently on. And I am pleased to say that the response to the book has been so positive end of life practitioners across the world have been reaching out saying, I know about this. Thank you for doing the research. Thank you for validating this. And this is just a major step forward in the modern world's uh, relationship to end of life. We're, we're changing it for something of fear and something at best, well, I should say not at best, but hopefully to wonder and hopefully receptivity about this glorious opportunity that we're all going to get to experience. Can I ask a question? Sure. Are there different forms of, of that shared um, death experience? Uh, do, you know, there's not just a stand, there's different forms. Yeah, there, there are identified four different, what I call modes of participation in the shared death experience. That's the way that the caregiver loved one uh, feels, senses this experience. One is you are remote. So it's called sensing at a distance. So you don't have to be at the bedside of your transitioning loved one. In fact, two thirds of our now over 300 plus cases that we've studied deeply are remote. Wow. And the other, there's other three others, I'll say them briefly, uh, witnessing what we call uh, death related phenomena. So that's like seeing your, your departing loved one transitioning, moving. Uh, into this afterlife, seeing the light uh, in the distance that your loved one's moving towards, seeing other elevated spirit beings, seeing other uh, deceased relatives who are yeah. greeting, greeting your departing loved one. And then we mm -hmm. also have situations where the uh, loved one, the surviving loved one says that they're accompanying the dying in this journey. And in some cases, they're guiding they are orienting them and saying, hey, dad, your, your mother is right behind you. She's waiting for you. And you go, oh, really? It's like, well, yeah, turn mm -hmm. away from this earthly existence and look what's ahead for you. And then they're off and going. The motif is journey. It's a beautiful journey. That's the dominant uh, pattern that we see is that our loved ones on journeys after this life. Wow. Yeah. Well, that can certainly be comforting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Marianne, for saying that, because that's really the reason that I got into this is like, wait a minute, grief and bereavement is so difficult. But all of a sudden, someone will share with me sometimes three or four months into it. So, you know, I had this experience, but I'm not sure it really happened. I go, well, tell me about it. Mm -hmm. And they share, they start sharing a shared death experience. I look at them and say, that's a shared death experience. That's a gift. If it was true mm -hmm. for you, what does it mean? And all of a sudden, they start sharing it. They start weeping with joy. Come back the next week and say, that changed everything. I, I, I miss my loved one. I'm no longer with him or her, but I know that I'll see them again. And I know that they're right. okay. And that okay. changes everything. Yeah. Knowing that they're okay. Um, yeah. I think that's it gives us peace. Yes. Thank you so much. Hey, right, so, uh, well, I'm going to really try hard not to cry because um, mm -hmm. I wish that I had gotten to know all of you before my journey with my father. Mm -hmm. Um, and everything that you said, oh my gosh, I mean, you would have thought that you guys have known each other for years because you all mm -hmm. contributed, um, to really, I think, assess or assist the audience on their journey, because as I, I mean, they're all different and we all know that, but just hearing all your experiences is so incredibly helpful. Um, and you know, we talked about family dynamics. That was one of the questions in the chat. And I think we totally answered that. And, um, but you know, the guilt that we all, and, and we all have it when you, you feel you can't do enough. And what Christy said about sometimes she was very short with her mother. I mean, my goodness, same thing with me and, and my kids helped me with that. And it is so multi-generational and Lauren, I actually got to know some families at Kensington where the parents were visiting their children that had early onset. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I can't imagine how, how difficult that was. And uh, Christy, uh, same with you. Um, 
I can't believe we're almost out of time. I literally, this could go on for hours. So we, we will have to meet again. And it would be <laughs> great if we can meet again in person because um, I just have so much respect and admiration for what you've all done. And the community should be so grateful that you've written books about it. Um, so thank you, Marianne, for founding All's Authors. I mean, I oh, really thanks. wish, I really wish that I had had this library before I went to the <laughs> Because yeah. this is like yeah. my bedside reading. And William, thank you so much. It was so hard for me to sit, you know, with my father for days uh, in his passing. And the, the team at Kensington was so helpful. But I hope everybody buys all of these books. <laughs> um, they are so great, really great to have. Not as reference, but um, Christy, your book is like, I went through it and I made notes in it to, to help me um, because I get so many questions from people. So yeah. they're all just so heartfelt. And so with that, if each of you would just, just read an excerpt from your book to kind of share with the audience, uh, get a little get a little piece of, of, of your book because everybody's going to buy them. So <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, start with uh, Marianne because okay. Marianne is an author. Yes, <laughs> I am. Um, I've chosen to read um, from the prologue of my book, which is a novel. It's an Alzheimer's love story, and it takes place on Cape Cod. And I like to think of this scene as the this couple, Jack and Sarah, they're entering the winter of their marriage. They have just received the diagnosis and is Jack's first acts as a caregiver. While night settled on blue hydrangeas, Jack and Sarah lay nestled on the couch, wrapped in a hand-knit afghan and clinging to each other as silent as stones. The lights were out, a crackling fire lit the room and shadows danced on the walls. He cradled her in his arms and stared into space, detached. She focused on the fire, unyielding in his embrace, so far away. The bark he had put on the CD player had long ended. Outside, the first snowfall of winter blanketed Cape Cod. He had done all he could to make this evening the same as any other, but this god-awful quiet made everything seem so wrong. After 45 years of marriage, it wouldn't have surprised him if they had run out of things to say, but not a day ended without some new insight or tidbit of information passing between them. They shared everything, their deepest fears, their most private thoughts. Tonight, there was nothing just this palpable silence as they ruminated separately on their visit to Dr. Fallon and the horrifying news he had given them. Um, I so appreciate that. And, and William, you and I have never talked about it, but I think, and, and everybody touched on this, but supporting my mom through my father's journey was as difficult, if not more difficult. Um, and um, so, you know, it's the couples that you're married for 60 years and you are suddenly half mm -hmm. widowed and you see your loved one just slowly, slowly have a very long passing, which um, mm -hmm. I wish I had read William's book. I'm just loving it now. I um, wish I had had that before I went through that experience. But Lauren, go ahead and read a, a passage, please. Sure, this is um, from toward the end of my book called When Only Love Remains, Surviving My Mom's Battle with Early Onset Alzheimer's. I'm also incredibly grateful for the opportunity to experience true unconditional love, both given and received. I experienced a love that does not rely on verbal communication or memory, but on the deep bond between a mother and her daughter. My mom may not have remembered my name or that I was her daughter, but she knew me on another level. She may not have recognized my face, but she recognized my soul. She knew my heart and my love. She knew the sound of my voice and the feel of my touch. She knew my presence and that she was safe with me. She knew when I entered the room without even having to open her eyes. She turned her head toward my voice without having to understand what I was saying. We could sit for hours on end without saying a word because our shared silence was filled with more love and meaning than I had ever experienced. My mom knew me by heart and I will be forever grateful for the experience. Beautiful. I think everyone needs to have that tattooed on their arm. Yeah. 
um, because that. it's so hard. You think you're going to remember everything and you just, it, you, it's, it feels like a blur. Um, thank you, Lauren and, and Tammy, our guiding light here. <laughs> our so resource. I actually am going to read what a, um, the loved one with dementia and what they want the caregiver spouse to know and or the adult child to know. As we talked about, caregiver guilt is enormous. So I want you to hear these words. And when you doubt yourself, I want you to remember what is being written here. I know you will take excellent care of me. I want you to trust your decisions on my behalf because you will be making those decisions with my best interests at heart. I will slowly lose my ability to communicate this message to you. And no matter what happens, if my personality changes, or if I say and do hurtful things, or if I don't cooperate when you're trying to help me, I'm not doing this intentionally. It's dementia causing me to do these things. Every step of the way, know that I love you and I thank you. I support whatever decisions you make, even if I don't express my support and instead I get angry or appear unhappy. Please know that my reactions aren't because you're making the wrong decisions. My reactions are because of dementia. I want to apologize in advance for what you may go through while taking care of me. Know that I am grateful for everything you do for me, even if it means I need to be moved to a care community. Please remember my words and not what dementia takes away from me. Oh, I think we all agree that being able to put a word or a label on it rather than a behavior um, really is nice. It's really nice. Uh, and Christy. Sure. This is from the end of my book. Um, with time, I could also see how I had changed for the better. I learned a lot of lessons from my parents. One of the best gifts they gave me was planning for the end of their lives. They made the tough choices so their children didn't have to. Assisted living, cremation services, burial at a national cemetery, Catholic mass. They also put enough money aside for their care. My siblings and I didn't have to accrue debt, and that was, for us, the gift of freedom. We were and are lucky. This isn't the case for everyone. My husband and I have spent time trying to do the same for our children. We talk about our wishes for the future and for the end of life. We try to normalize conversations about end of life issues so that our kids can ask questions or at least feel comfortable knowing we're not leaving everything up to them. But we don't know exactly what tough choices they'll have to make. Which one of them are going to have to have, which one of them will have to have the painful car key conversation with us? We also emphasize our value of compassion. How does compassion continue to show up in their lives? How are we continuing to be compassionate with others in our lives? Thanks. Boy, that's a lesson learned for everybody. I don't think it's ever too early. Uh -huh. Really. Um, and William, I'm so excited to hear what you're going to read from your book. So this is from, this is one of the 28 stories uh, in my book. This is just a snippet. This is about Adela. Adela was uh, at the bedside when her father died, and he was an atheist, uh, a real staunch atheist, but here she goes. As he grew sicker, Adela and her mother became his full-time caregivers at home. She recalls the moment her mother came into her room adjacent to her parents. Her mother said, I think he's gone. He stopped breathing. I walked in, and he was not in his body, not in his body anymore. But what I saw, I saw him clearly, as clearly as I see you now, slightly elevated, but in the corner of the room, a light behind him. I said to him, go to the light. And I smiled. He started laughing. It was the most beautiful, amazing moment between us. So many rich layers of things coming together right then. I was laughing. He was laughing. And then he turned and he went. He was gone. Adela describes this experience as occurring in a sacred space, as if she had stepped into another beautiful dimension. It wasn't an ordinary realm. Words could not adequately describe it, really. What she felt was strongly, was very, what, what she did feel was very strongly the rightness of it. She adds, we were very close. 
And it was so sad to not have him here with me anymore. But it was his time. His body did not allow him to have any more quality of life. He was complete. And he left without fear. I knew he was fine. I had lost, I really had missed him, but I know he is in the place he needs to be and in great comfort. You know, so, um, that's beautiful. And uh, someone wrote to me who lost both her mother and father to Alzheimer's when my father passed and said, you need to know and feel good that his memory is restored. Yeah. And that, that was really, really beautiful. So um, we're getting in the chat. I don't know if you guys can see this, but Trudy, thank you for your note. It says, thank you all so much. Tears running down my cheeks. And then uh, Santu wants to know the organizations that Lauren mentioned, and please everyone know that you will receive a copy of the webinar and we will also put Lauren's organizations that you mentioned something about a support group, Daughters of Alzheimer's. Um, so we will make sure we put those links and um, I'm so sad we're out of time, but I just can't thank everybody enough and thank you to the audience and Stay tuned because we will absolutely do this again. And you guys are amazing authors. You're amazing people. And thank you for sharing and writing down your experiences and your journey because it's so helpful to people. I mean, I know for sure. I wish I had had all this. Mm -hmm. When my dad was diagnosed, I don't think I knew what a caregiver was, except for I was one suddenly. <laughs> and, and Leslie just said, thank you so much. So um, the feedback is tremendous. And thank you all. And have a safe night and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you so Thanks, much. Everybody. It was a lot of pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay.